Okay, we'll move on to this uh, discussion of valve actuators for positive positioners. So this uh, positive positioner is, uh, is used and applied for these valves uh, in order to be able to have the, and I'm going to take my cursor over here, uh, it's very difficult to see it in this particular picture, but inside uh, and through this uh, valve actuator, there's actually a, a pin or rod that comes through this area and tells this positive positioner, which is this gray box with black knob on top, it tells this positive positioner what position physically the disc and plug are in. So what we want to do is be able to give feedback about the actual physical position of this valve uh, and plug and sitting on the seat and what position is this actually in. We may be sending a pneumatic signal from the thermostat or controller to say this valve ought to be at 50%. Uh, and But whether or not it is at 50%, unless you have feedback coming from this valve uh, going up in through this actuator up into this positioner, uh, we really don't know uh, that this valve is actually sitting at 50%. So they invented these positive positioners to be able to take this uh, valve signal coming in, and it will be on the pilot side of this uh, positive positioner. The branch line would come in here, and you also have available uh, full main air pressure coming into this positive positioner, then to be able to say, if I'm not at this 50% position, the positive positioner says, oh, I need to be at 50% because the controller is telling me to be at 50%. And it will then take the full 20 pounds of air and either push up or pull down on this, uh, on this valve actuator to be able to make sure that the valve down here towards the bottom is at 50%. So this, uh, this positive positioner has a couple of functions that actually make sure that the valve is where it's supposed to be. In the example I was giving at 50%, it also has the ability to be able to, uh, what we call, start the sequence of operation from whatever this controller uh, controller branch line air pressure is coming in to the uh, positive position with. It can actually be dialed to say, I want to start at 3 pounds, or I want to start at 4 pounds, or I want to start at 5 pounds. And then the, the spring range of the uh, actual valve actuator will take over from there. So that's the purpose of this black knob that's sitting on top of here, to be able to uh, move that back and forth. So as you might imagine, uh, I like to use the word stiction. It's a combination of the words sticking and friction. As that stem becomes sluggish or becomes sticky in the packing, the positioner will oppose that and maintain smooth modulating control. The other neat thing about the positioner is that it allows you to very specifically select the range of modulation, whereas before we were looking at the natural spring range, that dictated the stem movement and pressure relationship. This device allows you to make that act over any range you wish with great precision. If we, uh, I think maybe we're going to try and go back to that original slide that you were going through with the uh, with the uh, blue and and lines sure. to show people how important this is to be able to make sure that the valve is where it's supposed to be. Exactly. So, so let's get people, and hopefully people will be able to see this. We'll give them a couple of seconds. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, uh, your screen might be eating a little slower than ours, but on the uh, graphic that we looked at before, the 2 to 7 pound spring range for the heating valve and the 8 to 12 pound spring range for the cooling valve were just that. It's just the relationship or the, the compression rate of the spring in those actuators. What you're going to end up with, in this example at least, is a one pound dead band because it's in that range that the heating valve is fully closed, the cooling valve is fully closed, and you're just left with that dead band. In the case of these valves being fitted with positive positioners, we could make that dead band anything we want it to be. When you flip open your Honeywell or Johnson or anyone's catalog, you're going to find that there's some very standard spring ranges. But for example, uh, if you needed to sequence several valves, you would have to have positioners only because you'd never find the spring ranges you wish. So this allows you to not only maintain very precise motion of the valve stems, but it allows you to sequence outside of spring ranges that are commercially available. What you'll oftentimes see on valves, uh, heating coils that are very, very large, you might see two steam valves. We call it a one-third, two-third scheme where 
you'll have one very small valve that handles very light uh, heating loads, a larger valve that opens with an increased need for heat. In that scenario, you'd need to have a positioner on each because we want to uh, control the spring range, the start points of those two valves so that they never overlap into the cooling range. That's a typical example for that. Or if you have a uh, economizer cycle, you might need to shift spring ranges to accommodate the economizer operating sequence with the heating and cooling valves. So uh, just a little great additional detail there. So Thank you. We're going to jump forward a couple of, uh, back to our original and get into the pneumatic damper actuators here. So bear with us uh, as we step forward. And uh, we should be, we'll give you a couple of seconds here for the system to catch up. And we should now, you should all be seeing uh, pneumatic damper actuators now. Right. And on the, the bottom left, I should say, let's see, there's one, two, three, four electric actuators toward the bottom left. And then the pneumatic options are on the right and top right. The bottom right is what you would typically see in a smaller unit, a smaller unit ventilator. You'll see that the actuator diaphragm is obviously very small. It's very compact. It's not designed to overcome a lot of force with very large dampers. The one above it you'll see is a little different in that the spring and piston is completely contained. You can't see any of those parts. Above that is a larger model that has a positive positioner on it, much like the ones that we had just explored for the valves. These are available on pneumatic actuators for dampers as well. And the last one is just one that has a pivoting base. These, these come in any number of sizes and configurations to fit the most common applications. Within, uh, there's just a real simple depiction here of, of a damper actuator. You'll see that there is a linkage between the actuator itself and a crank arm on the damper. We like to think of the damper really as just another type of valve, but in this case for air. This damper might be a two-position damper, for example, uh, interlocked to an exhaust fan on a roof. It might be part of an economizer scheme or a relief damper where we want continuous modulation. These damper actuators are inherently proportional. Again, it's just like the valve actuators where the two position nature or the modulating nature is a function of the control, not of the actuator. Unlike valves, damper actuators always retract on a fail in pressure, a loss in pressure, the stem retracts. So as you air it up, the stem extends. The the fact that the actuator is going to be part of a normally open or normally closed damper is strictly in how it's linked. Yeah, so let's take a look at that on the next slide. Uh, to John's point here, as far as the uh, rolling diaphragm again, very similar to the uh, to the valve actuator that we have in this particular case, zero pounds coming in between and on top of this bladder. Once the branch line from the controller starts to increase its uh, pressure, then this bladder starts to push against the spring and extends this shaft push rod out. So the, uh, the rolling diaphragm here, again, is, adjust is taking the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the changes as far as the air pressure coming in on top of the bladder. And like John was saying, in this particular case, we have this, uh, this particular damper with the uh, push rod being actually attached directly to the damper blade. And the damper blade in this particular case is attached you know, above the axle of the damper. So this round circle that's right in the center here is the axle or center point of the damper blade. So if this uh, rod then starts to push against it as branch line air pressure builds up, in this case we're actually going to be pushing this damper closed without any kind of branch line air pressure or at zero pounds like this is showing. This damper is actually going to be full open. So that's the area that John was talking about, that there is no such thing as a normally open or normally closed uh, damper actuator. It actually depends upon where and how this push rod is attached to the damper itself, and therefore that in the field is how it's determined whether it's failing open or failing closed. 